Hello, Paul Wilkinson here. This is a video about William Blake. I have with me one of my very, very favourite books of all time. The Complete Illuminated Books of William Blake. Uh, it's a book I touch upon every week, I would think. It contains all these great, great works. And as it's coming towards proms time and people will be singing Hubert Parry's music and William Blake's words to Jerusalem and Elgar's arrangement, I thought it'd be nice just to talk a little bit about the words and what they might mean. There is not just one truth, but what they might mean. And um, as you'll see when I, I read a little bit of this and I'll show you inside um, this, that the, um, the words actually come from uh, the end of Blake's epic poem called uh, Milton. And I'm going to show you that so you can see, see Milton. And so the words I'm going to read are from this book I've been working on about. Attention and awareness, I think, to sum it up in, in a couple of words. It's about what we call meta theory, about different kinds of thinking, comparing what we might call our common um, epistemic thinking of today, which could be classed as concluded thinking um, or dead thinking, not alive thinking, because these kind of modern uh, epistemologies that we use, uh, I would suggest, are, are like corpses lined up, hence the term which Rudolf Steiner would use of, uh, of dead thinking, it's not alive. You're already running a concept of what something is, but what Immanuel Kant would say is that uh, it's a noumenal world, we'll never know the, the thing in itself. And so our language is a synthetic reduction of that. And there is a literalness to words, you know, turn left, go right, and then you'll arrive at the pig and whistle. And, and those words are useful. But there is also anotherness to the words, a metaphor uh, or a syntax, not just being the word in itself, but like a vehicle onto a, a whole other new meaning of the word. So I'm going to read a little bit about this um, from using from my book, just a, a couple of little uh, snippets from my book. But I use great poetry as a, a vehicle to flick to extraordinary consciousness. And so I thought it might be quite nice. Uh, there is not just one truth, as I say. Um, so let's have a listen and let me show you um, Blake's uh, Milton. And we can see the um, preface, which he ultimately discarded. His later copies, the words Jerusalem actually weren't contained um, in the later copies that, that he printed. So it's interesting, isn't it, that the words that we all sing so much were actually ultimately discarded. Uh, so here we go. Let's have a little look at this beautiful book uh, from inside. And I'm sure you'll agree it's absolutely stunning. And this is all. Blake completed all of this. Um, it's fascinating to see that. This is all his work. He was the poet, the artist and the printer. OK, let's have a look at uh, Jerusalem. Hubert Parry, the British composer, set these words to music which he found in the poetry anthology called The Spirit of Man. This came out in 1916. He gifted the hymn's copyright to the National Union of Women's Suffragette Societies. I suspect the vast majority of British people would like to see this as the national anthem. In a way it has been adopted into that position. It's sung everywhere including schools the very place Blake attacked for producing human uniformity. But what is the otherness to these words? What are they evoking? And where did they come from? These four verses are from the opening preface of one of Blake's amazing illuminated books called Milton, a Poem. A work that took over a decade to complete, comprising of 50 pages. He ultimately discarded this plate from the later editions. He did write a prophetic and amazing book called Jerusalem, the Emanation of the Great Albion. Blake believed this to be his finest work. The word Albion is the earliest known name for Great Britain. This beautiful prophetic book tells the story of a sleeping giant called Albion having a terrible nightmare. The nightmare being English imperial history. It essentially tells the story of how Albion needs to be woken up to a spiritual renewal. 
This is embodied for Blake in Jerusalem, a beautiful feminine figure that has been enslaved and needs to be saved and rescued. It's a long poem about spiritual awakening via the imagination. Spirit's divine imagination lie with the God within. The hymn begins with, And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountain green? It's interesting that it starts with an open question. If the divine was present in England, might it once return again? Did Jesus walk these British lands with his uncle, Joseph of Arimathea? Or is Blake writing about Albion, the ancient name of Scotland and England before the kingdoms existed? In this meaning, he's referring to the physical land, but Blake would also employ this in his mythology of the universal human. Does he mean Albion will walk these lands again? The human that is not disconnected from Gaia. What Jean Gebser called the unperspectival world. In the words of Gebser, the unperspectival world suggests a state in which man lacks self-identity. He belongs to a unit, such as a tribe or a communal group, where the emphasis is not yet on the person, but on the impersonal not I, but on the communal group, the qualitative mode of the collective. This is something that Rudolf Steiner believed. Owen Barfield referred to this as final participation. Both men arrived at the same idea, independently of each other. The concept that the human wouldn't forget themselves and this would be unified in a wholeness with that of the original participation. Think of it as a letter U. The top left side of the letter being the original participation, the bottom of the U representing the intellectual soul and the top of the U representing a reunification. Not different, but alongside. Once again, returning to the spirit world, a world of wholeness. What does Blake mean by satanic mills? The obvious one is a reference to the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. But Blake could be referring to the church, orthodox Christianity. The people working in the mills are trapped in a new mechanistic oppressive paradigm, a wheel within a wheel. Those wheels then grind each other together, missing the beauty of existence. The satanic mills could also be a reference to academia, such as Oxford and Cambridge. He writes and paints beautifully about this in his profound work, Songs of Innocence and of Experience. Here is the poem, The Schoolboy. I love to rise in the summer morn when the birds sing on every tree. The distant huntsman winds his horn and the skylight sings with me. Oh, what sweet company. But to go to school in a summer morn, oh, it drives all joy away. Under a cruel eye unworn, the little ones spend their day in sighing and dismay. Ah, then at times... I drooping sit and spend many an anxious hour, nor in my book can I take delight, nor sit in learning's bower, worn through with the dreary shower. How can the bird that is born for joy sit in a cage and sing? How can a child when fears annoy but droop his tender wing and forget his youthful spring? Oh, father and mother, if buds are nipped and blossoms blown away, and if the tender plants are stripped of their joy in the springing day by sorrow and care's dismay. How shall the summer arise in joy or the summer fruits appear? Or how shall we gather what griefs destroy or bless the mellowing year when the blasts of winter appear? When nature is stripped and named in spring, it does not grow through summer and autumn. Let's get back to Jerusalem. It's a poem with meaning upon meaning, if you can attend to its otherness. As Owen Barfield wrote, we can only cope with the dangers of language if we recognise that language is by nature magical and therefore highly dangerous. When Blake writes bow of burning gold and arrows of desire, I believe this is a reference to the spiritual awakening and the building of a better society, maybe one which was present long ago, 
but is still present within us now. Overthrowing the current governance. Time for a revolution, perhaps. I will not cease from mental fight. In the words of Barfield, nature is to be redeemed by imagination, is to become imagination. I would suggest exploring Blake's prophetic illuminated books. They hold the portal to a beyond and before, but it's outside our comprehension to build a Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant lands. Don't think of Jerusalem as it is now a state called by both Israel and Palestine. For Blake, it was a city where God resided, the site of the Temple of Solomon, originally constructed around 960 BCE. I would also suggest that as Blake's Albion mythology, Jerusalem is not just a physical city, but also a society. A society that viewed the world with oneness and love inspired by the beauty of the imagination an original participation, a human consciousness before ego, one that we still see present in the animal world, not a subject-object perception, but one of oneness. I believe the hymn wrongly rouses a nation towards battle and war, but if we could sing this song connected to its real meaning, a mental fight, now that would be something. You can't kill people with arrows of desire. After the last verse, Blake adds a Bible quotation from the Book of Numbers. Poetry and music are powerful creations that move us, but there is no way of making what they say explicit. You can't explain music and the feeling you receive from it. What is made explicit for me is not worth my care. It has to be something that the imagination has to come to work with, not yet finished when we engage with it. The finite, not the infinite. In the words of Juan Mascaro, all life is action, but every little finite action should be a surrender to the infinite, even as breathing in seems to be receiving the gift of life, and the breathing out a surrender into the infinite life. Every little work in life, however humble, can become an act of creation and therefore a means of salvation. Because in all true creation, we reconcile the finite with the infinite, hence the joy of creation. When the vision is pure and when creation is pure, there is always joy. By definition, the finite cannot know the infinite.